This is the update to our advancements in force transfer on openings for wood frame shear walls. And to start with our learning objectives, we'll begin by investigating the past and current methods for determining force transfer on openings using wood shear walls. Per rational analysis, there's a variety of methodologies available that engineers use regularly. We'll also look at the effects of different size of openings and full height piers, so the different code allowable height to width ratios, different size of openings, and how that impacts the force transfer and the performance of the walls. Focusing more so on the new design methodologies to accurately design for multiple openings with asymmetric piers. Too often, we have design examples that are a perfect world with a small opening with equal peers on either side, which doesn't match reality. So our goal is to really match what's being built in construction more accurately for your purposes in the office. And lastly, looking at the deflections of these perforated shear walls and what is the best way to do so. Our agenda matches our learning objectives. We'll begin by looking at the shear wall design challenges globally, the history of our research to date, and then focusing again on where we are now with looking at asymmetric pier widths, multiple openings, C-shaped panels, the deflection calculations, conceptual keys based on our recommended design methodology at this time, and the benefits to doing so. Before going into the laboratory, we began by doing a field survey as well as a designer survey of how things are being done. And looking at these photos, we see that how buildings and houses have a lot of design interest today. We have many openings, jogs in the wall, and the availability for our shear walls, particularly a two-to-one aspect ratio, can become quite challenging. Just looking at this podium structure in the top left corner, we see the variation in the wall in and out of plane. And the need for a FTAO or a perforated shear wall becomes more evident. And we look at a variety of these other structures as well, and we see that not just one type of shear wall is used. We have some prefabricated shear walls. We have a segmented shear wall. You have force transfer around openings, and that's important to note as well. Is you don't have to use one type of shear wall for the entire structure. You can mix and match story to story, wall location to wall location for the best fit. So before we focus on FTAO, let's look at our full spectrum of shear wall choices per the SPIDWIS, the Special Design Provisions for Wind and Seismic, which is part of AWC's NDS. And in SPIDWIS 4.3.5, it defines the different shear wall options. You can do a segmented approach, force transfer, or perforated. And we'll compare and contrast these to begin, especially for those of you who don't do wood design as regularly. And when we begin with the segmented shear wall, as shown on the far left, your aspect ratio in the past was 2 to 1 for a seismic control design without a design penalty, um, up to 3 and a half to 1 with a reduction. Well, the code change that's coming is they're going to apply this aspect ratio to buildings nationwide, regardless if it's high seismic or high wind. And we will go into that in greater detail um, for all of our shear wall approaches. But with a segmented wall, what you notice if you look closely at this picture is that underneath these openings, we have some open studs, some wall studs here that don't have sheathing on them. And they likely just used a segmented approach, where they looked at the full height segments, considered those their shear walls, and sized their hold downs, the shear nailing, and the base shear for each of those shear walls independently. Force transfer and perforated are two approaches where you look at the wall as a, an entire shear wall with openings provided. The way you do the design varies, however, in that the perforated approach is an empirically based method. This was based on testing that originated in Japan. You look at the percentage of your full height sheathing in the wall line and the maximum size openings, and based on those two variables, you will select a shear capacity adjustment factor, basically a reduction or a penalty that you apply to your shear calculation, your hold downs, and your, your anchorage at the bottom of the full height pier segments. 
and that's your perforated approach. However, our force transfer in the middle, and that is our focus for today's discussion, is another perforated approach. It's not based on testing historically. Instead, it's based on a rational analysis. And what that rational analysis, as I mentioned already, can vary quite a bit from design office to design office, engineer to engineer. And what you generally will see in the field is that we see that we have straps on the exterior of the wall, generally above and below your opening, and that's going to be transferring the tension force, and there's blocking on the inside of the wall, transferring the compression force, and then the sheathing, which is not just the full height segments, but also above and below your openings, is transferring your shear wall, shear forces, to create a single shear wall hold downs at each end. Another bit of information on comparing and contrasting these items, as I mentioned, the height-to-width ratio has changed. This requirement used to apply the 2 to 1 minimum for just high seismic without taking an adjustment. Now the adjustment, if you exceed 2 to 1 for the 2015 SPIDWIS, is globally going to be applied to all structures. So again, if you're designing in Ohio today, you, under the previous code, you wouldn't have to take a adjustment if you went up to three and a half to one. You will now need to do so. The adjustment factor, however, has changed. So we'll look at what that is in a moment. For force transfer around openings, looking at the basic design here, you'll notice, again, we have a hold down at either end and then the sheathing is providing that shear resistance, attachment at the bottom of the wall, straps above and below the opening, blocking on the inside. A main advantage to FTAO is in how they define the height to width ratio. Notice on this slide, you see that the height is defined as the height of the opening it's adjacent to, such as a window. If we go back to the previous slide, for the segmented approach, the height-to-width ratio is based on the full height of the wall. So our walls are generally 8 to 10 feet in height. If you want to meet that 2 to 1 aspect ratio to avoid an adjustment, and on an 8-foot tall wall, you would need to have at least a 4-foot width. If we go to our force transfer around openings, perhaps this is an 8-foot tall wall again. Next to a 4-foot tall window, you could go down to two feet and still meet your aspect ratio of two to one without taking an adjustment factor. So this is one of the largest advantages and driving factors of why structural engineers use FTAO. It's in situations where the height to width ratio will not work for that full plate to plate height. Going to the perforated approach, again, we see that in this instance, we are looking at this as a single shear wall, so you have only hold downs at either end. You do have attachment at the base of the wall, particularly at the full height segments. We have eliminated the strapping requirement. So given this method was based on testing, the strapping was not required for the tension transfer above and below the window. So this is one reason some designers like to use this perforated approach for their client's sake to be able to avoid that additional hardware. The converse or the challenge, however, though, is the height to width ratio, again, is measured the same as it is for segmented. So your height is based on the total height of the wall, not the height of the opening that it's next to. So if you're in a case where you can't meet the height to width ratio going plate to plate, you likely won't be able to use the perforated shear wall approach either. You'll have to go to the FTAO. This is, again, what we needed to do. We didn't want to just look in the field as to what we saw being constructed. We also wanted to understand what the structural engineers were doing. Um, before I get there, I do need to share with you the adjustment factor changes and the deflection requirement changes for the new SPIDWIS, the 15 version. As I noted, and instead of applying that adjustment factor only for high seismic structures, now all shear walls that have an aspect ratio that's greater than 2 to 1 but less than 3 and a half to 1 shall apply a reduction factor. The old reduction factor was 2 times the actual width over the height. There's a new aspect ratio factor, as shown here, equal to 1.25 minus 0.125 times h over the width, so the height over the width. 
And speaking with a structural engineer recently in Denver, he noted that this was a less of a restrictive adjustment in his experience based on previous application of the two times the actual width over the height. So some good feedback for those of you if you're wondering, well, what's the impact going to be on me when I use this new aspect ratio factor? The other item that you may or may not be aware of is per 4.3.3.4.1 is that individual shear walls and lines shall provide the same calculated deflection. Except you do not have to do that if you have shear walls that exceed the 2 to 1 aspect ratio and you use the historical adjustment factor of 2 times the actual width over the height. So this is one way of simplifying your design calculations and not having to go through that step of showing that your individual shear walls in line do have the same calculated deflection. So be aware of these options. Another clarification for the new SPIDWIS that's useful to note is with the perforated approach, in the past the question would come up, well, some of my walls meet the 2 to 1 aspect ratio in my perforated shear wall, but not all of them. So do I need to apply that adjustment factor to the entire wall because it's considered a one perforated shear wall, or do I apply that adjustment factor only to those segments? And now it's clear that you're going to apply that adjustment only to the individual wall segment, say L4 and L1 were a three and a half to one aspect ratio wall, where L2 and L3 were not. You would apply the adjustment factor to the length of L1 and L4 and not to L2 and L3. So it's less of a penalty than it had been in the past, but note that it is the historical adjustment factor of two times the actual width over the height, not the new adjustment factor equation that I shared with you a moment ago. As noted, we went into the field as well as into the design offices to see what was being used before we began our research study in our laboratory. And based on a field survey in Southern California, for 18 plus sites in multifamily and single family structures, we found that for multifamily, 40 to 90 percent of all shear applications utilize some amount of FTAO. The single family structures, 80 percent had at least one application on the front or back elevation. 70 percent had multiple applications, front, back, or both, and 25 percent had a sidewall application in addition to the front or the back. If you think about your home or the homes you drive by, where are the majority of the openings? In the front and the back of the house. So this should make sense to us that we say I saw the need for FTA or that was what was used because they had those narrow height to width ratios based on the number of openings, which drove the requirement for FTAO. The joint research project was done with APA as well as the University of British Columbia and the USDA Forest Products Lab. UDC provided a finite element analysis component to the project. They replicated the same testing that we did in our lab in a computer model to show the same results, as well as the Forest Products Lab provided oversight in a managerial aspect. The goal was, as noted in our learning objectives, was to look at the variations in walls with different code allowable height to width ratios, 2 to 1 versus 3 and a half to 1, different size openings, different levels of detailing. Did we only sheathe the full height segments and do a segmented approach, or did they sheathe the entire wall, not have the full hardware as, say, a perforated wall versus a full force transfer around opening where you have the strapping and the blocking provided? In addition to recognizing what was done in the field, we wanted to compare that to the rational analysis techniques that are typically used by structural engineers and to identify the most accurate rational analysis that matched the testing as far as what were the strap forces that we measured in the lab that would match most closely to the commonly used rational analysis techniques. Anytime APA does research, our goal is to be able to make things better for the construction industry. We want to help engineers design faster and better, contractors to be able to build faster and more efficiently. So looking at the design techniques, 
surveying structural engineers, we found three common techniques. First was the drag strut analogy. As shown in this simple diagram, you are dragging the loads above and below the opening and using the geometry of the wall to concentrate those forces and calculate your strap forces at the corners. For the cantilever beam analogy, you take the same wall, and now we're going to break the wall into segments and then sum our moments to solve for the forces at the corners. So if you think about a, a moment that you're going to be calculating based on this geometry, and if you think of a typical wall, where do we tend to have more sheathing, above our opening or below our opening? Generally, we have more sheathing below our opening. So when you're calculating your moments and summing for that force, where are we going to tend to calculate that we have a greater force? We'll have a greater force at the top where we have less of a resisting arm, since we have less sheathing above our opening, generally, versus below. And so that's another item to keep in mind when you're using this technique, how that might vary in comparison to the drag strut analogy we just looked at. Or another common technique is the Diekmann technique. This can also be attributed to Cobain, Thompson, Steox. There's a variety of engineers who really pioneered this method. And basically what you do is you're going to solve this via principles of mechanics, breaking down the wall into little segments using our simple statics to solve what our forces are in each of these segments, putting it all back together and checking your work. So applying this to a simple wall example, we have a 2,000 pound shear force at the top of the wall, two foot three for the first wall pier, four feet at the other, two feet top and bottom. So this is asymmetric, which is interesting to note, but unrealistic in that we have the same height of sheathing below, above and below. Overall wall length is 10 foot 3, and the height of the wall is 8 feet. If you run through those three analogy methods, which again, these were the most commonly used per hour survey of structural engineers, we found that the drag strut analogy yielded a forces of 284 to 493 for your corner forces. The cantilever beam analogy resulted in 1460 or 2540, and the Diekmann method, 567, 986. So looking at these numbers, we see quite a spread. And the question is, are they all correct? Are they all incorrect? Which one should we use? For more information on these methods, I do have the full calculation of that quick summary I just showed you. If you'd like that, I can forward that to you via email. We also have some other resources. Part of what initiated this research was an article written by Zeno Martin, one of our research engineers, and this was in Wood Design Focus. So the first reference here is that article. Again, a copy I can forward to you, and it also shows the cantilever beam analogy there. Ed Diekman actually wrote back to Zeno Martin via the magazine in a closure response to the original article, and the Diekman technique is also very well described in the Briar textbook, which I'm guessing many of your offices have a copy of that. And the Seahawk or Thompson method is available in the what was formerly known as the Seahawk Seismic Design Manual. These are available on the ICC website, and they've just been updated for the new version of the code. Um, not quite yet available for sale, I believe, but will be shortly. We will get to our results, though, as far as which one was most accurate, so we can sit on our knowledge of the different techniques, let's take this into the lab and see what we found. So here is a typical setup in our laboratory, and you see OSB used for the wood structural panels above and below the opening. We have hold downs shown here replicating the flat straps, and many monitors attached to the wall in a variety of places. All of the walls were built 12 feet long, 8 feet tall. We had 12 different wall configurations that were tested, 
some with FTAO, some without. The wall nailing was 10D common nails at two inches on center for all the walls. And we used 15 30 second performance category, struck one OSB. You may be asking yourself, why did we select these particular materials consistently? And the reason why, if you're familiar with the history of the perforated wall, which is the one that's based purely on testing, you may recall there was a limitation to the maximum shear you used to be able to use in the past. And that was based on the testing. They had only tested it to that level of shear capacity. So we didn't want our research to be limited based on us selecting a lower level of the shear capacity. So we took it to the top of the chart. Struck one, 15, 30 seconds. And why we chose OSB versus plywood, there are some people who believe that plywood is superior to OSB. If we've done all of our testing with plywood, they may feel that, well, we can't apply this to OSB. So that was the reason why we selected OSB. And the 10 penny common nails were the same as the first argument in that we wanted to get the maximum shear capacity. So we had to go with the largest nails with the tightest spacing. The walls were tested using the cyclic loading protocol, Curie basic loading protocol. I've only highlighted a few of the wall configurations. The full research report is available on our website. But in the interest of getting to where we are today, just wanted to give you the highlights from the first phase of the testing. And so beginning with wall one, you see we have our 3 and a half to 1 aspect ratio for our wall. And so we ended up with a 2 foot 3 pier length on either side. There was no sheathing above or below the openings sheathing only for the full height segments with hold downs at either end. So we are recreating that segmented wall. For wall number four, this was our first wall that had the full force transfer around opening, complete detailing. So it's the same geometry as wall number one that we just looked at. But what you have now in addition is that you have sheathing above and below the openings. And we no longer have two hold downs for the full height piers, we only have one hold down at the left end and at the right end. We have the, the straps provided by the hold downs on the exterior of the wall and um, the nailing as appropriate. Wall six is the same as wall four. The one change here is that when we compare back to wall four, you notice and you may think about a typical wood structural panel is four feet wide by eight to 10 feet in length. So this wall length, you may remember, was two foot three. So this is cut in line with the full height segment. The wall number six was the full four foot length of the panel with the opening cut out of it. And this is commonly done in the field. We wanted to see how it compared in the testing. If having that C-shaped panel contributed to the force transfer around openings. The panel helped transfer the load. Wall number 12 was our last segment configuration that really provided us with some great information as far as going around multiple openings and asymmetric piers. We see we have different pier lengths for each of those full height segments. It does have the full FTAO detailing, so the hold downs at either end and the strapping above and below the openings. I did not mention this already, but you may be scratching your head thinking APA is crazy. They think that people are constructing walls with hold downs on the exterior of the walls. That is not the case. We certainly understand that flat straps are used. These hold downs were done for ease of replication and monitoring in the laboratory environment. We did additional testing with flat straps to show that we had the same results. So just wanted to add that in case this was on your mind. So what information was obtained? We, again, monitored the different aspects of the building from the anchor bolts to the hold downs to the straps to collect this information. How far was the load pushed um, versus the, the load that was applied? The, the displacement versus the load, and 
provided historic plots for all of this information. We used a reference deformation of 2.4 inches, which allowed a maximum of 4.8 inches on the wall. And this was based on our historic testing of shear walls throughout the years. So again, looking at the test setup from the exterior laboratory, and then our results. So what we see here, and the color coding is very important. It's not important to be able to read the specific numbers. You can, again, download the report and spend time looking at each of the wall performances and the techniques comparison. But what we are showing is that we have the walls identified on the left, the measured strap forces that were collected during the test in comparison to the common techniques that are used. So again, we have our drag strut, cantilever beam, the Diekman technique, and the SEOC technique. Comparing the measured strap forces versus what was estimated, you see that the yellow represents items that were underestimated. If we estimated less than what was measured, it's identified with a yellow blocking. If what was estimated per, say, the cantilever beam technique was overestimated by greater than 300%, it has a green color coding. So just glancing at this table, we can see quickly that the drag strut technique, although it's relatively easy to use, many of us have used it, myself included, we see that the results are unconservative. And we don't want to be unconservative. On the other hand, when we glance at the table, we see cantilever beam technique is primarily green, particularly on the top force that's estimated versus what was measured. We recognize we probably don't want to use that method either because it's overly conservative and we're being hired to be efficient in our designs. So that leaves us with the Diekman or the SEOC techniques, which aren't the most straightforward to use. Many of us have spreadsheets to automate this in our offices, but a good takeaway is to know that really is the most accurate rational analysis technique to date. One thing to know is that when you look at wall six, you may recall that that was the C-shaped panel. And this was the only wall where the drag strut technique was accurate and more accurate than the cantilever beam or the other techniques because it was within that 100 to 300% accuracy. And that's because the panel was actually working to transfer some of that tension force which made it match more closely to what was estimated per the drag strut technique. And all the other techniques were considered way overestimated. So the C-shaped panel really does provide us some design assistance and something to consider moving forward. As mentioned before, here is a photo showing the flat strapping that was also done in the lab to show the same results were found with the flat strapping versus the hold downs on the exterior of the wall, which again were done just for ease of testing. Simpson Strong Tie also did testing in their laboratory using the same setup and the flat strapping and showed similar results to us as well. So our conclusions. Looking at these 12 wall configurations and the different level of detailing, we did find that the walls that were detailed with the full FTAO resulted in better global response. The stiffness of the wall increased as well as the strength for a force transfer around opening wall in comparison to just the segmented approach. When looking at your rational analysis methods, however, we also recognize that the drag strut technique was consistently unconservative. Cantilever beam was ultra conservative, which leaves you with the Diekman or the SEOC methods. What next? What else can we do to move forward? And feedback, again, time and again, was on the wall number 12 and the multiple openings. Now, before I move to the advancements, a note, if you're wanting to get more information, as I noted, the research report is available on our website, apiwood.org. Under the resource library, you can search for force transfer or M410 and you can download this for free. And Karen, I also wanted to just break in real quick and let and just remind people that I did include this in the a link for that and for also this 
proceedings paper in the handout email, and it is also linked in the SEU Resource Center, the page for this session. Excellent. Thank you, Lisa. Which brings me to the SEAC paper. So the other link that Lisa just mentioned is shown here, a little snapshot. Last year, Tom Skaggs, uh, one of our research engineers in Tacoma, and I wrote a paper for the SEOC, Structural Engineers Association of California Convention, titled Advancements in Force Transfer on Openings for Wood Frame Shear Walls. And this really focuses on wall number 12, the multiple openings, asymmetric piers, and it's also the basis of our upcoming APA system report, SR105, that is in development today. And here are the snapshots from those wood design focus articles that I mentioned before by Zeno Martin. And this really shed the light on the different analysis techniques giving you very different answers. And as mentioned, Ed Geekman had written back to Zeno in his original article with his own rational analysis approach. And he was so kind when we did our first phase of testing to provide us with design results for wall number 12 as well. So looking at wall 12, once again, we saw this earlier. This is the full FTAO detailing where you have sheathing above and below all of your openings. You only have a hold down at the beginning and the end of the walls. And strapping provided above and below, blocking on the inside of the wall. Multiple openings asymmetric peers. How do we provide this accurate analysis? And so comparing even the Diekman technique to the SEOC technique, there are some different basic assumptions. We're focusing on the Diekman technique for this presentation. Not to say you can't use another technique, but using this method, this matched the testing most accurately. And the base assumption is first, you assume that the unit shear above and below the opening is equivalent. Second, the corner forces are based on the shear above and below the openings and only the piers adjacent to that unique opening. So in the previous slide, we had two openings as shown. And when you're looking at this distribution of force, you're going to kind of break it down into each opening at a time before you put it all back together. The tributary length of the opening as well is going to be calculated or needs to be calculated to define how much shear goes to each pier. So in the Diekman technique, you're not going to have the same shear horizontally for your full height segments. That's going to vary. It's going to be the same top and bottom, but not the same horizontally. So you need to identify the tributary length that applies over that opening to each of your full height pier segments. And that's based on the geometry simply of the panel lengths next to that unique opening that you're focused on, one at a time. The next conceptual key to realize is that we're going to take that tributary length, add it to the pier that you're looking at, multiply that times your shear divided by the length of that pier to calculate that individual pier length horizontally. The final step is that you have to be able to calculate the shears in all segments of the wall. So we have those corner zones that have to be calculated as well. So that's based on the resistance versus the strap force divided by the length of the pier. The best part is the final conceptual key is that when you're done summing all of the shears for the segments, you can check your work. The first vertical line and the last vertical line will sum to the hold down force. And all of the vertical lines in between sum to zero if you've done your math correctly. So you can check your work at the end. Yes, this is a lot of keys that I've just thrown at you. We're going to apply it into an actual example to let that be reinforced. So we have a wall, 3750 pounds at the top of the wall. A variety of pier lengths, three foot six versus four feet, and four again, three foot six. Our length of our window openings, we have a six foot window opening, a two foot window opening, and a doorway, eight foot tall wall. Beginning with a segmented approach, if you take that shear at the top of the wall, you're going to look at the height to width ratio. We recognize that we have the four foot 
wall segments meet our two to one aspect ratio, the three and a half foot ones do not, they have to take that adjustment factor. This is the historic adjustment factor, the two times the actual width over the height. So you would adjust those narrower segments by 0.875. This is an option. You could use the new adjustment factor today, but then you would have the additional step of checking the deflection or calculating the deflection is the same for all of your peers at the end. So for simplicity, we'll use the historic one. You first start by calculating your unit shear, which is the 3750 divided by the height, the length of the full height pier. So we had 15 feet total, 250 PLF along the wall. So our shear walls for our narrower three foot six shear walls, we're using a 15 30 second rated sheathing, eight penny common nails at four inches on center. And applying the 0.875 adjustment to the 380 PLF allowable shear in the table yields 332, which exceeds our 250. So that's good. Looking at the four foot long walls, Again, here, it's the same thickness of the sheathing, it's the same nail size, but the nailing is at six inches in center, on center instead of four inches on center. Again, we show that we meet our allowable shear exceeds the design shear, and that's good. Hold down force, 250 times eight, so we need to have eight 2,000 pound hold downs. And that's a summary of using the segmented approach. Now, if we take the same wall in geometry and we apply the FTAO approach, we're going to begin our wall beyond the doorway. And the reason why is the first conceptual key is that we're assuming that we have an equal distribution of shear above and below our opening. If we included the doorway, there would be no sheathing below the opening. So in this case, we're going to begin it in this location. We check the height to width ratios. But again, since the height of our window is only two feet, eight inches, we don't have to worry about taking any adjustments. We easily meet the two to one aspect ratio requirements. So the first step is to calculate the hold down force. And the hold down force is that 3750 shear force at the top of the wall times eight feet divided by 19 and a half feet, the overall length. This is another advantage to using FTAO, is that when you calculate your hold down forces, you get to use the full resisting length of the wall because you do have sheathing provided below the openings. With our segmented approach, you wouldn't have that additional resistance because you don't necessarily have sheathing above and below your openings. The second step is to then sum the unit shear above and below the opening. So that essentially taking the hold down force, 1538, and you're dividing it by the height above and below so we find 288 PLF above and below our openings. Step number three is to find the total boundary force above and below the openings. For our first opening, we take our shear that we just calculated times the length of our first opening, six feet, and you have 1731 pounds. Our second opening is narrower, so we only have 577 pounds. Step four, calculate the corner forces. F1 and F2, you note, is the same force because we have the same geometry of the length one and two. They were both four feet in length, whereas three and four are not the same. So that's going to now adjust your strap force findings to 308 and 269. The next step is to find the tributary length of the openings. And again, we're going to calculate the tributary length of T1 based on simply the geometry of L1 and L2. You don't look at L3 when you're calculating T1. It's based only on that first opening. And so in this case, T1 and T2, again, are going to be equivalent because in this case, we have the same length for these walls, L1 and L2. So it equals three feet. For T3 and T4, we're now going to have two different lengths of walls. So we have 1.1 for T3 versus 0.9 for T4. The step six is to finally calculate the unit shear beside the opening. And we'll use the shear to the middle shear for an example. So here again, we need to take the sum of the tributary length T2 plus the length of pier two 
plus the tributary length T3, divide that by L2, multiply it times the shear divided by the length of the wall, and this calculates to 388 PLF. So our shears, as noted at the beginning, they aren't going to be the same horizontally. V1 is 337, V2 388, and V3 is 244. There's a mini check here where you can multiply your shear times the length, add them up, and you should equal the total shear at the top of the wall. To finish the design, we have to still calculate those corner forces in each of our segments. So the first step is to calculate the resistance to the corner force, which is simply the horizontal shears that we calculated times the length. So 1346, 1551, and 853. You take the difference of each of those resistances from the strap force that we calculated earlier, and then take that difference divided by the length. And that gives us our corner forces VA1, VA2, and VA3. Finally, we get to the last step of being able to check the work. So as noted, when you're all done, you can sum your forces vertically at line one and line six, and you should equal the holdout force. When you sum two, three, four, and five, you're going to be summing the shears on the left-hand side in comparison to the shears on the right-hand side, and it should equal zero. Our resulting design is shown here. Notice we have the same sheathing that was used as the segmented wall, 15 32nd rated sheathing, same nail, eight penny at four inches on center, only two hold downs at 15 50 pound capacity. Comparing those two methods with the perforated approach, which we didn't do the full design here, you'll notice, again, the same sheathing was allowed the nailing was slightly tighter than the other methods, and the hold downs were larger. And the reason why you have that is because you're taking that adjustment factor that's based on the maximum opening in the wall, as well as the percentage of full height sheathing. So in this case, you see we started this perforated wall, including the doorway. If we moved the wall to begin beyond the doorway, just like the force transfer, that would greatly help this design of the wall and likely bring it into the same realm as FTAO. The other thing to note is, well, why use force transfer on openings if I can do the segmented approach? We used a design example where you could use any of these methods, but as stated at the beginning, generally the driving factor for FTAO is where you don't have a wall long enough to meet your height to width ratio, whether that's two to one or even three and a half to one. So in those instances, you're really forced into using FTAO. The C-shaped panel, as noted in our testing, did reduce the amount of strap force required. If your contractor and your client is focused on eliminating as much hardware as possible, this is something to consider that you might be able to look at what are my strap forces that I'm calculating if I simply take a C-shaped panel, perhaps I can eliminate some of those straps that are provided. At this time, we haven't done any additional engineering analysis on that, but that's something that could be done today per your own rational analysis or something developed in the future. In this picture, note, you see that the force choice brown openings this panel was cut, or the opening was cut out of the full length panel. And the other thing you may notice is that Although they only needed hold downs at either end, they provided hold downs on the interior as well. And the question is, is, well, is that a problem? It's certainly not a problem. It will make a stronger wall. We tested to the minimum of only needing the hold downs at either end because, again, we're trying to uh, make a mo the most economical wall that's going to be safe for construction. Another question that came up many times following our first phase of testing was, well, what about the deflection of these walls and the drift on a perforated wall? How can I accurately design for this? And so we looked at the data and applied a the historical four-term deflection equation 
for our WID designers, you know that there is the historical four-term as well as the new three-term equation. Using the four-term, we use that in order to vary the height in the walls. And the assumption is shown here that when you push the wall from the left to right, that the height of the wall segments, we're only looking at the full height piers, and those heights are going to be limited if there's sheathing resisting that, that deflection. So one and two, it's only the height from the bottom of the opening to the top of the wall. And then wall three has nothing resisting it, so it's the full height. You have to do the same in the opposite direction and then average the two together. Again, many of you likely have a deflection spreadsheet set up in your office. This is easily uh, automated in a spreadsheet. In this case, we have a lot of data points to compare to our testing, but what's important to note is that the results based on using that analysis technique did match the backbone curve. And that was for wall four as well as wall 12 where we had multiple openings, asymmetric piers in both directions. So what are the benefits of force transfer on openings with continuous wood structural panels? For the structural engineer, it's a straightforward rational analysis. Yes, I went through a lot of conceptual keys and a lot of steps, but it's very straightforward. Basic math can be automated in a spreadsheet if you use Excel or even in another web-based application in the future. My favorite part, of course, is that you can check your work at the end. So this just shows a little summary table from our spreadsheet that showed the calculation for lines one and six that equaled the hold down and for the intermediate wall lines that summed to zero. This gives the architect greater flexibility as well. As noted, they can take narrower segments walls that jog in and out of plane, and you're able to have that height-to-width ratio that's simply based on the height of the opening it's next to instead of the full height of the wall. Our walls are often not even eight feet tall, but closer to 10 feet or taller now. So we need to be able to be able to use that reduced height when possible. Aside from the height-to-width ratio, it also gives you the continuous sheathing a more benefit when you look at the building envelope. Having an uninterrupted drainage plane, on the right-hand side, we're showing the four Ds of durable design, and you want to deflect, drain, dry, and use durable building materials. Well, having a continuous sheathing is going to aid in that continuous drainage plane. And in this picture, we see that the recognition of having that sheathing simply for the flashing detailing for the window, the door, and at the sill. The energy code is becoming more stringent nationwide and looking at solutions that meet the structural requirements as well as the energy requirements are more and more important. And so this particular assembly is one example where you're able to take a deeper cavity wall, two by six studs at 24 inches on center with this continuous sheathing on the exterior. So you're maximizing and maintaining your structural integrity of the wall, but being able to get your energy within that wall cavity and even going with an insulated header. You can do that with a wood structural panel box beam header as well, depending on the loads that you're carrying. And the energy loss is another feature. Taking off our structural engineer's hats, we have to often realize there's other challenges on the structure. And energy loss due to air infiltration is a major issue. Having a non-flexible sheathing, like a wood structural panel, continuously around the exterior provides that structural resistance, yet also provides that air barrier. Yes, you do still need to seal your joints, but you'll have fewer of them and a more strong and true item to nail to. And as noted before, the value prop proposition of being able to minimize the number of hardware looking at these walls as a larger perforated wall, you can have a hold down at the beginning or the end, or maybe not at all, depending on your overturning loads, those might be able to be reduced altogether. 
you have your continuous nail base in the stiffer wall, which is going to mean fewer callbacks down the road due to stucco cracking or water intrusion or wall buckling. So which brings us back to our learning objectives. First, we wanted to look at the past and current methods for what's commonly used for shear walls globally as well as specific to force transfer on openings. What is the effect of different wall geometries, two to one versus three to one aspect ratios and different size openings, different level of detailing from a segmented to a full sheathing approach and our new design methodologies, focusing on this Diekman technique, applying it to multiple openings, asymmetric piers, and our deflection methodology to be able to accurately calculate what your deflection is on the wall. 